Not much going on over here. Not too much going on over yonder or here. <laughs> oh, man. So, hmm. V Gates. <laughs> So how goes it, y'all? How is everyone doing? That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably like, that is correct. What are you talking about? I'm just saying, man, that is correct. So, yeah. Back to Russell Targ. And Carrigo. <laughs> Back to Russell Targ and Carrigo. You know what I find to be rather thought provoking? The uh, Russell Targ presentations as a whole, or I could just say Russell Targ presentations as a whole, but neither here nor there. Neither here. <laughs> nor there so <clears throat> fascinatingly if that's even a fucking word here or there um y'all are probably like come on Grove here there there here and I'm like yeah that is the question uh so I've been scoping out Russell Targ in depth, comprehensively. And what I find, a few things interesting, is that there is a video on YouTube, if you just quickly Google Russell Targ, banned. I don't know why people do this other than to say rhetorically that I assume the reason is that they are attempting to, uh, and now I'm not trying to be a stickler for grammar because though I am a grammarian, oh God, man, it all goes back to the goddamn fucking Mandela effect. So for those of you who remember what I remember, it used to be that in the world of punctuation, and I know, and I know, and I'll explain how very quickly. So when I was a prodigious youth, I had, I had a, an elementary school instructor, very dear friend of mine and instructor. She had African artifacts at her home. She was African-American, black African-American, and she, she would have annually students from not just her first grade class, but all the first grade classes, and I believe also second grade classes. So she would take both all the first grade classes. I could be wrong. I know it was all the first grade classes. And I believe also second grade classes. Every year at our elementary school to her personal home. And there would be cookies and milk and this kind of stuff, depending on you know one's allergy and this kind of thing. But the point is, is that she had uh, artifacts that some of them are in museums. And at some point she was on the Board of Regents and she was a civic leader in addition to being uh, an elementary school instructor. So I know some people, they're not really into the anecdotes. And they're like, come on, man, fuck that dumb shit, Grove. Just get to the goddamn point. Well, it is already at the point. Neither here nor there. And... What uh, what was interesting about her, <clears throat> in addition to her presentation that she would give annually, was that she really took a liking to me as a teacher to a student who saw potential in a student. And she told me, she said, you know, you can be anything you want to be. What do you want to be? And you're probably like, come on, dude, that's pretty normal. She said, I think you're going to be a lawyer. 
Now, she wasn't putting it in my mind to be a lawyer. I did consider it among many things. But what she went on to say, which was much more important than just simply, you might be a lawyer. She said, um, you're really good at this English language thing. You're really good with English. You're really good with grammar. You're really good with language arts. We used to call it. We used to call it language arts. And she said, I'll tell you what. If you can get to level eight by the end of the year, which was the fifth grade level. Now, keep in mind, I was in first grade. And I'd already gotten up to, like, the third grade level when I was in first grade with, like, three quarters of the year to go. She's like, I believe in you. And I know you can get to, the, to, to level eight. And I looked at level eight like, how the fuck am I going to muster that? But shit, I've been challenged to do this here type shit. So ultimately, as I'm sure y'all know, based on how I've prefaced it, I got to level eight, which resulted in being invited to a barbecue at her home. Her husband uh, is also a published author, and he drove an actual Rolls Royce. Now listen, (laughs) This is back in like, let's see, it was back in the early 1980s, early 80s, and like before 85, and that's how old this story is. So, but timeless nonetheless, because as I will have you know, if you allow me, she, um, she was a wonderful, wonderful person. And she had a son who was uh, later a budding aspiring DJ. And he and I, we went throughout the neighborhoods because I was always like into like street fighting, like martial arts and like fighting kids in the neighborhood because kids would just challenge. They'd be like, what's up, bro? You want to go? And I'd be like, let's go. (laughs) Now, if any of y'all know about the 70s and 80s, that was just the thing. And it still is the thing today with boys, right? Like anywhere in the world, pretty much. Um, so it was nothing ever like seriously violent or anything like that. Because back in the day, man, it was all about fucking like, like kung fu, karate, ninjutsu. And um, I guess if I say nin, I got to say jitsu. Um, <laughs> but I'm just, someone say ju, jutsu. Um. But it was all about like fighting, right? Like in the neighborhood. Like that's what kids did. Sticks, fucking rocks, dirt bombs or dirt wads as we would use interchangeably. And um, or say rather interchangeably. And uh, so her son and I, after we ate barbecue and like hung out, right? He was like, you want to go through the neighborhood? And I was like, let's go. And then there's this kid. He was a little, I don't know, tubby somewhat chubby, but he was a good fighter, man, and I remember, he was like, what's up, and he's like, I told you this guy's a problem, and I was like, what, he's like, yeah, and he's like, all right, you guys fight, now, I know, in the modern context, that'd be totally inappropriate, you have this elementary school teacher, she invites a student to her home, like, like, first and second grade classes, and then she, like, you know, she, uh, she, she, she singles out one, and then she's like, yeah, and now the the bar you can go hang out with my son. Now that the barbecue's over, and you know, you're probably like, "What? This is crazy!" Look, it was normal shit. Like nothing weird went down. Like wasn't anything inappropriate, man. I was just hanging out with her son in the neighborhood, and her son, um, good dude, man. Um, and you know, he went on to DJ. But back then, man, he was like showing me around the neighborhood, and he's like, "Yeah, there's this one kid. He thinks he's tough." And you'd like to fight, so let's see what's up. Like, he's always a menace. <laughs> and this kid, he and I were like the same age. And it was pretty evenly matched, man. Like, I mean, this kid and I threw down. And, and it wasn't like a bloody fight or anything. But, man, we were like like fighting, like punching each other and kicking each other and doing like acrobatics. And it was pretty fucking nuts, dude. <laughs> I mean, if YouTube existed back then with the internet, it just would have been a viral video. Um, and then we just kind of dusted it off. And, and, and you know what? I actually, I went back 
I went back to her home. She invited me back for like, like another barbecue. Anyway, um, sadly, sadly, she, uh, she, she, uh, acquired MS, uh, multiple sclerosis and, uh, she passed. And that happened decades later down the road when I was, uh, I believe at the time I was in the Midwest and I got the news and I was just like, that's fucking tragic. Like what? And they were like, yeah, she developed MS man. And she's like failing. And I was just like, whoa, 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 what? And they were like, yeah. And, uh, I mean, man, she was a wonderful person. Um, brilliant, just very like, what's the word, man? Not just likable and generous. I mean, beyond generosity, like just a genuine soul, like someone who was just like giving and, you know, her husband, again, he, you know, is a published author. And I mean, a long time ago, man, if you had a Rolls Royce, it's like, I mean, most teachers, I'm just saying like on a teacher's salary, like they lived in a, they lived in a nice community. Um, <clears throat> so, and I'm just going to put this out there and, and this is really interesting too. And I'm just saying from, from the perspective of like architecture and aesthetics, their house was like a dark, not in a gloomy or like foreboding way, but it was, it was like, it was like a dark, <clears throat> let's see, it was like a really dark, uh, like reddish color, not, not like, like, like chestnut or, uh, it was almost like a chest, like a, like a really dark chestnut color with like blacked out windows. So you couldn't like see inside. And the interior was like a museum. And she had these magnificent African art pieces that I said, that as I said, some of them had been and later ended up in museums. And it was amazing. It was just absolutely fucking amazing. So, what does that have to do with Russell Targ? So... Back when I was a scholarly, prodigious youth, our school system, um, <clears throat> we were part of the, we were part of the, uh, the America where it was supposed to be this new system of learning where it didn't matter your skin color and it didn't matter your socioeconomic background and all this kind of stuff, right? And everyone was supposed to have equal opportunity. So I remember in addition to, to my uh, first grade instructor for the portion of the day where I would go literally like two doors down, there was this white Caucasian woman. I'm pretty sure she was German and she was my English teacher or language arts. And she, <clears throat> she equally believed in me as well. She was a very nice, very kind, seemingly genuine woman. And she saw some type of potential in me because she would reiterate it and she would echo um, the same sentiment as my first grade instructor. And they talked and she would drill me on English, the English language and grammar and you know, sentence structure and s syntax and semantics. And, and, and she said at some point, you know, you're reading at the college level. And I said, okay, keep in mind, I'm like seven years old at the time. She's like, no, do you know what that means? And I was like, and I didn't really honestly know what that meant back then. Cause I was a seven year old kid. And, uh, she was like, you were reading at the college level. You're a seven year old. 
she said, imagine when you leave elementary school and you go on to junior high school. She said, you can do whatever you want. I was like, what? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I mean, now keep in mind, I'm a seven-year-old, but I remember at the time. She was like, listen, there are people who are in, because this is when I had reached level eight and then beyond that, because I went beyond that. And she's like, these books that you're reading now, these are beyond uh, elementary school and even junior high school and even high school. She's like, you're reading at the college level when you're a seven-year-old child. She said you could be an astronaut, like your instructor said, your teacher, primary. She said you can be a lawyer. She's like, you can do whatever you want. She said there's nothing stopping you academically. You've already achieved great things. And I was like, wow, thank you. She's like, oh, you're absolutely welcome. One of the things that they taught us was that Whenever you use quotation marks, the quotation marks go outside the end of the sentence after the exclamation mark, the question mark. Yeah, they don't go inside. They don't come before. They go outside. So... Sentence ends, question mark, and then quotation marks. Sentence ends, exclamation point, or exclamation mark, whatever you want to call it, and then the fucking quotation mark. The ending quotation. On this timeline, that shit doesn't exist. Now, I know some of you are like, come on, Grill, that's a false memory. Oh, it's absolutely not a fucking false memory. That's absolutely the way it fucking worked. <clears throat> but according to the Mandela effect, that's never been a reality. And if you want to say that 50% of the world global population is fucking totally schizophrenic, then that's your choice. I know what I remember because it was drilled into my memory in other words, it was made indelible and it was imprinted by, I believe, a German woman. I'm just saying. The largest ethnic population in the United States until a few years ago, until it was superseded, that is, surpassed by uh, Hispanic Americans, was uh, German American. And I come from a German American uh, family, household, and, uh, we have friends who came directly from Germany, immigrated, and they worked in groceries, in a grocery store, uh, saved up money, and, uh, put it into stocks, and bonds, and mutual funds, and working at one of the largest, uh, grocery store chains in America, you would never think, as they bagged groceries, and, worked as checkout clerks, that they were multimillionaires, and they are to this day, and they don't look a day over fucking 55, and they're in their 90s, so I'm pretty sure that this woman who taught me English <clears throat> was a German-American woman, and the point is, I remember exactly what the fuck under her tutelage I learned, then one day I woke up, <clears throat> went on the internet, shit seemed weird, and I was like, something seems weird, and I looked up McDonald's because in my mind's eye, I'd just been around some city and I was like, and it, and it was kind of like a glitch. And I was like, something just kind of like hassling me to like Google. Like, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. McDonald's. Something on the radio, something I saw, something I heard, and then seeing the golden arches, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on. And I typed it and it didn't come up in Google search engine. And I was like, no, 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 no. Something's weird. Something's weird. Now, <laughs> if you think this is fucking bullshit, I'm about to let the cat out the bag. Have you ever looked up DARPA on the internet? Have you ever looked at the DARPA official website? Have you ever been there? There? 
there. <laughs> Wherever you are, have you ever been there? Have you ever visited the domain of DARPA? For those of you who know what I'm alluding to, depending on where you are, you cannot access the DARPA website. That's right. Because the network where you are won't let you access it. No, I know. You're probably like, come on, girl. It's a U.S. government website. It's just like the FBI. It's just like the CIA. Why would we not be able to access a U.S. government website? It's like public information. Hey, I asked DARPA public uh, affairs folks and officials at DARPA, and uh, they said someone will get back to you with that answer, and they never did because they will never. <laughs> Depending on where you are, man, you either can or cannot access DARPA's website because on certain networks, they don't want it accessed. Now, you might be like, come on, dude. Well, let me tell you this. I've worked in cybersecurity and I still do. And there are some places where DARPA's website cannot be accessed and I'm talking about in the public domain. So, you're probably like, all right, let's say that's true. How does DARPA, how does McDonald's spelling, and how does your experience as a first grader, how do, how do all three of those data points tie into each other? How do they all connect Grove? Oh, by the way, this is C4CW, casting 495 celebrities worldwide, and I am the host of the show. And if you are true fans, then I, we 495, most certainly appreciate you. So as I promised, yesterday or today or whenever, whenever we are. <laughs> Carigo is an interesting website because when I signed up for Carigo some years ago, it basically stated something to the effect of, hey, listen, so when you sign up for our website, we just got to let you know, um, by clicking and checking and agreeing to the terms of service agreement, by use of this website, you agree to and consent to the following. This website is maintained, was created by, and is facilitated, housed by <laughs> neuroscientists, and you are part of essentially an experiment. And I was like, oh, really? Well, fuck, I already agreed. Now, I know you guys probably go, come on, bro. Come on, bro. What Carigo does is it creates long-lasting, long-term memories. And when you go through the various modules, for example, it'll say, <coughs> no disrespect to Carigo, I just got a Hakalugi. Did I get it right? Is it Hakalugi? Chuckalugi? Hakalugi? <laughs> You're like, Chuckalugi. <laughs> Um, remember those kids that would spit in their hands and then they would chuck a hawked loogie? Um, you're just like, ew. Um, for those of you who remember. So, in the collective memory, going through the Akashic records, um, of the multiverse, superverse, <clears throat> Carigo would say something and will say something like, Hey, you've studied for X amount of time or N amount of time or however you want to define time with that variable that you use. It'll say you study for X amount of time. Regardless of what you want to do, you can't log back into the system until 7 hours, 3 minutes, and 27 seconds. And some microseconds. And you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, because if you do any login before that, you will not form a long-term memory. It will simply go into your rote short, short-term memory, and that will be that, and it will defeat the purpose of Carigo. So again, the whole purpose of Carigo is they have this hypothesis, this theory, this idea that based on their mathematics, if you view and interact with certain information over intervals of a certain length of certain lengths of time you will form long-term memories that you cannot erase <laughs> <laughs> what 
Once it's long-term memory, <laughs> unless it's some type of military-grade uh, removal process, you will have long-term memories forever and ever and ever, forever. And um, you can find pretty much anything in the world of, like, education. You want to memorize periodic tables, foreign languages, math, science. I mean, just anything. Anything from A to Z. And they have people who contribute who are not part of Corrigo. So anyone who wants to put a set, uh, who wants to add a uh, study set to Corrigo can sign up and do so. And so, for example, during the tensions between the United States and North Korea, learning that North Korea has its own dialect of Korean, in addition to the, what is it, is it eight? I can't remember. Things get shifted around. But let's say that there are eight dialects of Korean. Or is it nine? Or is it eight or nine? Well, neither here nor there. More than five. So, North Korea has its own dialect of Korean. Oh, yeah, that's right. The North Koreans, they speak their own language, man. It's different. It's different than South Korea. It's similar in some ways, some respects, some regard. But it's also different, man. So, I was like, well, I'm not in the U.S. Armed Forces, but I keep having these really surreal like very surreal, like remote viewing sessions where I'm like in the fucking war, man. Like I'm on the battlefield with North Korea and I don't want that to happen. But what the fuck in some parallel time frame? Like what? And I've already seen some shit that I've talked about. So I'm like, maybe I should study North Korean. I don't really want to. I mean, it's going to take time. I know a little Korean because I study Korean as a second language. But now I've got to study North Korean. I don't have to. But shit, what I'm seeing here is from the U.S. government. And apparently it's open source. So they have this open source shit where through different uh, sources... And in terms of resources, channels, conduits, coming from the Defense Language Institute, the U.S. government has made certain language learning modules for the North Korean and other languages available. So you may be saying, okay, growth, that's normal shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. It totally is. <laughs> hey, man, listen, it's neither here nor there. <laughs> So what I've, what I've found lately, I'm going to bounce around a little bit, but I'm going to tie it all up tonight and tomorrow and today, wherever it is, whenever we are. So one of the things that I, so when I was in college and I had a bunch of fucked up jobs, I actually worked in a movie theater. And one of the days I was only there for like fucking 30 days, um, but I was an usher and I'd worked in concession. I was at the concession stand and shit. And then I was an usher because I thought being an usher was going to be dope. But then I learned that I had to clean all the fucking theaters. It wasn't just like, you're like, your ticket, sir, ma'am, ma'am, sir. Nah, dude. And, you know, I was still young, man. So I didn't have the proper, like, dress attire and shit. My fucking feet hurt. And it's like, even with cushions and some, like, orthopedic shit. It's like, you try to cushion it up. It's like I'm wearing men's dress shoes and shit, but it's like my feet, man, because you'd stand for eight hours. And of course, you're an usher. You can't fucking sit down. Why would you be able to? That would only help you and it wouldn't help the theater because it's their fucking way of hurting you and giving you some fucking shit money for, you know, your eight hours of fucking bone breaking time, right? So they're like, you can't sit down. Imagine a theater where you like just walk through the door and there's no one taking your ticket. Or if there is, someone's like sitting in like, some cush like, like lazy boy. <laughs> You'd be like, dude, what are you doing in the lazy boy? And you're just like, I'm just cooling. You got a ticket? I'll take it. You know what I'm saying? Or they just roll around like on some type of like little, I don't know, like motorized shit. Not because it has anything to do with like disabilities or like 
someone's like challenge. I'm just saying, like, imagine if it were like some shit where you go to the concession stand and people aren't standing up. They're like sitting in a chair. Oh no, dude, that would make too much sense. So you can't have that. So you got to have people standing for eight hours a day. And then guess what happens? What the result net result is high turnover rate. And you constantly got to rehire and, or, you know, hire new people and train them. But you know, these fucking dinosaur medieval fucking corporations on this timeline, they're fucking rejects. So anyway, I became an usher and, uh, so I'm in this theater and I'd been there for like almost a month. And one day it was like during the week on like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when like it was like low volume, like foot traffic and shit patronage. I happened to realize that there are all these little sayings everywhere. And I was like, oh, I, didn't, I never saw this shit before. What is this? This is weird. And I'm looking around at the sayings. And one of them, dude, stood out. And it said something to the effect of all of life's mysteries are answered. <laughs> Let me back up. All of life's mysteries. Now keep in mind, there's like a thousand of these little sayings and shit scribbled. One of them was just like, boom. <laughs> and I was like, I've never seen these before and I'm only seeing them now. All of life's mysteries, dot, dot, dot. Are revealed in the movies. And I was like. Huh. All of life's mysteries. Are revealed in the movies. My mind flashes to CIA. And it's like. And the truth shall set you free. So I'm like okay hold up. Flash forward to what I had read. Regarding the Terminator movie, and as I have podcast about in the past, I know this is a lot of, like, super string. I know it's a lot of super string. We're stringing the super fucking strings together, the data points, right? And we're stringing it all together, and we're looking at it. We're looking at it. (laughs) Neither here nor there. And what it says is that... um, when you when you look into when you look at the data link analysis and you hear about these producers true story who went to DARPA again defense advanced research projects agency mad science wing of the department of defense and they said hey we're from hollywood and we're making this movie about killing robots they're like yeah welcome to DARPA and they're like yeah listen we have this crazy idea about these like robots that like go a i rogue haywire and they're like huh okay tell us more and they're like i know right crazy and they're like um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is it and they're like what and they're like yeah so the robots it's like skynet and they're like uh Show us what you have so far in terms of your renderings and drawings. And then the DARPA managers looked at each other and they're like, this is for the movie that you're making? And they were like, yeah, that's why we're here. And they were like, wow. Um, we need to talk. Yeah, you see, um, hmm, in this movie, how far into production? They're like, it comes out in a week. And they're like, oh, uh, hmm, who? <sighs> Damn, you shouldn't have. <sighs> so, so here's the thing. These robots that you've made that are like air quotes advanced, we're not really supposed to tell you this. Oh my God. Um, we have shit that's more advanced than this. And the Hollywood execs were like, "Uh, excuse us. And they were like, 
yeah, this this is ancient technology. And they were like, no. And they were like, yeah. (laughs) So uh, when I went back and I reviewed Terminator, I saw this video that shows a lot of shit that I didn't know about Terminator. I didn't know about the arachnid with the little pokey, like little fucking pokers and shit that's at the center of the shit. And I didn't know about how the what is it the 800s how they were guarding 24 hours one of their data complexes and shit there's this like um what do they call it like a roundup where they like discuss like comprehensively they break down like the the lineage the story like shit that like on the production level like it's all the shit about like terminator from the like creative development developer like writer script writer screenwriter screenplay fucking standpoint so anyway, flash forward, one of the things that we heard as children that I've talked about before, about 36 minutes in this shit, if you've listened to my podcast, then you'll know, in the past I talked about how we had elders who whenever we talked about Boeing, the Boeing company, There's another Boeing company. It's called the other Boeing company. Now, if you've ever heard of Skunk Works, Phantom Works, Phantom Works, Skunk Works, there's a separate entity of Boeing that is the Boeing company, but it is referred to as the other Boeing company. Now, again, it is Boeing, but it's a Boeing company that most people in society don't know exists. And it's Boeing, but it's the other Boeing company. And they work on classified projects at Area 51, S4, and elsewhere. Apparently, they're uh, hugely responsible for a large part of our secret space program. So Gene Roddenberry, who was supposedly the person who came, air quotes, up with this whole story concept of Star Trek... In circles through grapevines behind scenes, as it were, he didn't really come up with it. It was a data transmission that was sent to NASA that NASA did not understand what it was looking at at the time. And when they were finally able to decode the information with NSA, CIA, other agencies, it was a blueprint for the fucking USS Enterprise. And they're like, what are we looking at here? Is this a toy? What the fuck? Is this Hasbro? Like, what the fuck? How did this come from space? What the fuck is this? You know, if you know people from Boeing, you would get these big ass blueprint like scrolls that are like, you can buy them. And it's like all these different ships from like Star Trek. I had one and some and a few as a child from Family members and friends, people who knew people at Boeing, people who worked at Boeing. And if you think this is totally bullshit, I had a very well-respected math teacher who my cousin Rizzo and DJ Slomo were also in the class, many of my peers. And our math teacher, he doubled, he was dual-hatted as a football coach. And he told us... The same story. He's like, "Uh, there's a rumor. But back in the day before the internet in the 80s, shit like this was like, Area 51 was referred to as the black hole program. Anyone who worked in the black hole program, that that was the code for Area 51. (laughs) And some people thought, well, that means like, It's sensitive information, like information goes into it, it's black, it's like black secrets, like black chamber, like, you know, black hole, it's a hole of information, what goes into it disappears. He's like, no, no, the black hole program, as in there's a black hole in Area 51, that's what Area 51 is, it's not where aliens crash landed per se, it is. 
I mean, and from elsewhere, and they're taken there, but there's a black hole there. And we're like, what? what?" And he's like, yeah, it's the black hole program because there's a fucking jump zone at Area 51. And we're like, okay, there's a black hole on Earth. And he's like, yeah, I'm a math teacher. They're naturally occurring. They can occur anywhere and or they can be artificially created and induced. And we're like, uh, what? He's like, yeah, so... Star Trek, it's not, it's not, it's not fiction. It was, <laughs> he's like, it was a signal that was received by, by NASA in the Boeing company and they decoded it. And then they had a front man who they propped up, who's Gene Roddenberry. And they attributed him to having been the creator and the originator, but it's not really from him. He's just a commercial corporate front dude. The shit is from some unknown fucking time space. So now imagine this. Now listen, listen. At the University of Maryland, flash forward like 30 years. At the University of Maryland and Brookhaven National Laboratory and other places. So University of Maryland and Brookhaven National Laboratory and in Australia, and many other places, artificial black holes are now created in laboratories. Do you remember when John Teeter, this guy who they gave the name, he didn't call himself John Teeter, but he was given the name John Teeter? Kind of sounds like John Connor a little bit, right? Now keep in mind, if some dude came up on the internet and was like, I am John Teeter, you'd be like, dude, you totally ripped off Terminator, motherfucker. Instead of Connor, it's Teeter. He didn't give himself the name John Teeter. Someone gave it to him. He was very accurate about a lot of shit. It's Larry Haber. I'm a debunker. It's Larry Haber. It's Larry Haber. I use the voice analysis program. I'm a debunker. <laughs> yeah, he's a fraud. He and his brother and their son, they're like related to like a grandpa <laughs> who like worked for IBM and that's how they know about the APL like 360 like ROM. <laughs> you know, they can decode shit like, you know, <laughs> and they're not supposed to know, but since they have a relative, that's, and I used a voice program, and that's and when you hear Larry Haber talk, it's the same as John Teeter's like language syntax semantics. Uh, I'm a debunker, <clears throat> and I'm like, really, fucking stupid ass punk kid. So Larry Haber sounds algorithmically like John. Teeter? Okay. Maybe he does, to a T. Have you ever heard about Aldebaran and the Nazis? And, uh, what was her name? Maria? Corsich? I always get that shit wrong. But, you know, the woman who channeled Aldebaran. And the Nazis built the Nazi bell, the Glocka, because she channeled what they were telling her from some other point in space time and they beamed the information into her mind and she channeled Larry Haber he sounds ju- right she sounds just like the Aldebarans she sounds just like the Aldebarans and guess what where do you think stealth technology came from on this planet oh yeah Aldebaran Oh, yeah, the Nazis, the Third Reich. Yeah, is it Orsic? Oh, that's what it is. I say Corsic, but it's Orsic, right? Is that what it is? Is it, is it Orsic? I'm not even going to look it up on this other fucking computer. I have three of them right here in, in my car, like John Teeter. <laughs> I do, though. That's crazy. But here, check it out. So this punk kid, fucking idiot, imbecile who knows nothing about the multiverse, he can't even he doesn't even know what channeling is. He just assumes he thinks that he he thinks that Larry Haber and his son and like brother made up this story. Hey, maybe they did. Maybe they fucking did. And you know what's you know what's interesting about that? Okay? Let's say let's let's say they did. <laughs> this is how fucking novice and and this is how this is how 
this is how amateur this fucking so-called investigator kid is. I debunked it. They're just frauds. And Andrew Basajo or Basiago or whatever, the Seattle attorney, he says that he physically traveled through time. He's just a liar and a fraud. Yeah, and let me also tell you about Larry Haver and his brother and and, and their son. And, <laughs> yeah, they're all frauds. Hmm, I don't know, dude. When I listen to Andrew's stories... He's a lawyer, man, and I think he has like five degrees or some shit. <laughs> as far as I know, he still practices law, so I doubt he's an insane person. And apparently his father did work for DARPA. So do you think do you think that a man with like five degrees who practices law, whose dad worked at DARPA, do you think there might be something? Go- and then Jesse Ventura even said when he and his team investigated Andrew, they're like, Something happened with this guy involving the U.S. Department of Defense. And I saw <laughs> I saw where Andrew tried to go to his childhood. There's something about when you travel through time, you're not supposed to go back to your childhood home. <laughs> I'm just, listen, listen. I don't know if it has to do with antimatter. I don't know if it ha- what it has to do with contact. But apparently, if you're from another timeline, you're not supposed to return to the exact point. You can come within closeness and nearness, proximity, but you're apparently not supposed to go back to that exact fucking set of axes. Not supposed to do that. Oh, yeah. And they had someone stationed there. And she questioned him. And... She acted like he was an insane person, and then at some point she was like, look, I'm with the Department of Defense, and I don't know how you know this shit, but you got to get off the property. And it was like, whoa, 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 what? Yeah, because for the length of time that he was there, she tried to play him off as being some type of psychotic. She's like, "I, I I don't know how you found the information about the interior of the home. Maybe you just looked up the, like, Zillow shit. But yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, there's a room there. There, She's like, but you say that you were a kid, like a child in a U.S. time travel program, like, and you were with the Department of Defense, and you have an above secret clearance at the time, and you were where, what, like, at these agencies and these facilities? She's like, no. And he's like, no, it's absolutely true if you let me continue. And then at some point she's like, listen, I'm going to have to um, let you know at this point, I'm with DOD and you're going to have to leave this fucking property immediately. So why didn't she just tell him that up front? Up front. So when you look at these movies, <clears throat> if you if you observe these movies, there's almost kind of like in the movie Highlander, there's like a quickening now. It's like a quickening where all of these different movies that used to be disparate, where you would have like sci-fi, time travel, sci-fi, time travel, time travel, time travel, sci-fi, time travel, all these different stories of time travel, they were all slightly different. Well, now they all, these, these ones, now they link up and they say the same shit. You're not supposed to go back to where the fuck you came from exactly because it's some dangerous shit. They even did it in Stargate. They even did it in Stargate. And when they came back, spoiler alert, through time, they were given um, cover names and they were allowed to uh, be uh, in public, but they were watched and closely observed by U.S. government agents, but they were not to communicate with each other. They were allowed to be on this timeline or that timeline, but they could not communicate with each other, even though they're part of the same team. The government of that timeline broke them up. And said, look, you can be here and we're going to figure out what's going on, but you cannot communicate with each other from this point forward. You can walk about in public, but you cannot do this, this, and that. Same thing with Andrew. They're like, get the fuck out of here, dude. You can't be on this property. Uh, so what I'm saying is this kid who's like, you know, Andrew's a fraud and the story of John Teeter. Well, if the story of John Teeter's fraudulent and it's fake um why why is half of the story sanitized from the internet and hidden from the public and the information about the ibm 5100 let's just say it's a national security issue 
let's just say the reason that it's sanitized from the internet is because it relates to, or, or rather the uh, IBM 5100 um, with the hidden component feature, let's say that's just simply hidden from the internet because of, you know, the, the, uh, you know, consequences, consequentially the ramifications, the potentiality of that um, being understood by the masses and individuals or adversaries being able to use that hidden component to decrypt certain information that they otherwise would not be able to decrypt, should not be able to decrypt because it's a corporate national government defense in, uh, you know, military intelligence establishment issue. Okay. I can accept that, but let's get back to the part about the timeline outside the scope of the IBM 5100 hidden APL 360 feature. Most people who have heard the John Teeter story, they haven't heard the other 50% of it that was scrubbed from the internet, hidden away. The first half of the story sounds like anybody could have written the shit. Yeah, some lawyer could have doctored it up. Anybody who has like, a distant or relative who, you know, worked at like IBM, whatever. But when you read the 50%, that was recovered, by the way, by hackers, <laughs> a hacker. If you read the other fucking 50% that most people who think they're familiar with the John Teeter story, when you read the other half of the John Teeter fucking story, dude, it doesn't really sound that far fucking fetched. Really doesn't. It really doesn't. In fact, buddy of mine from college, he said, I was, we were talking about the Pledge of Allegiance. I was like, yeah, you know, early morning, some, some. He's like, Grove, what are you talking about? And now he's someone who attended East Point with me. And you're probably like, what are you saying, Grove? East Point? You weren't in the military and it's West Point. Right. East Point was the opposite coast. And East Point to us is where we went to school and where we learned to be computer hackers, dumpster diving, war dialing, telnetting, doing things that cyberpunks and traditional hackers did. We call our school East Point. And... So over time, he and I have had these types of conversations and discussions that I'm having with you, the audience here. He's very well versed in space-time anomalies and time anomaly research, everything that is Montauk and Project Sign and Project, uh, you know, Blue Book and and uh, the whole uh, umbrella of MK Ultra. I mean, every fucking previously fringe topic that one could conceivably talk about this is my this is my bro from fucking from the old school like hacker days of like other like time frames so i'm talking to him on on the phone and if you've ever seen the movie apex 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 i'm talking to him and i'm talking about the pledge of allegiance and he's like what i was like yeah you know how kids do pledge of allegiance in the morning He's like, Grove, what? And I was like, yeah, you know, in the morning time when kids in public schools pledge allegiance to the flag. And he was like, Grove, they haven't done that in 25 years, dude. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay, dude, that's funny, you know, but I'm being serious, bro. And he's like, no, Grove, like, 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 hold up. He's like, you're talking about early morning pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I'm like, right. The daily early. Mo He's like, Grove, they stopped doing that 25 years ago. And it caught me off guard, man. And I, and, 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 and the hairs on my arm stood up for a minute. And I was like, now, now listen, I know that like schools are trying to like de individualize folks. They're trying to deprogram and reprogram and wind up and have these kids like not win anything and no one can like be on top of shit and everyone's the same. You can't wear Mickey Mouse or G.I. Joe or like 
fucking transformers like they don't want people wearing logos or happy fun cartoons it's like going toward this like stalinist like mussolini ish like kind of fucking like Mao Zedong, pull pot type shit but i was like we still have the pledge of allegiance and he's like no grove no <laughs> no no dude now listen i don't have kids he does he said, Grove, the Pledge of Allegiance has been gone from the public school system, man, for most of America for like 25 fucking years. When he told me that shit, man, it took me back to the second part of the John Teeter story that most people do not know exists. The John Teeter story is not that far off from what is now. That's what a lot of people don't know. Even people who follow that or think that they follow the John Teeter story. The John Teeter story is pretty close to what we have going on now. The only difference fundamentally is the number of persons still on the planet. Now, if you follow the John Teeter story and you know about the second half where they attempted to fucking wipe that shit from human existence so that you didn't know about it, whoever wrote that shit, I mean, dude, let's say it was Larry Haber and his brother and their son. Let's say it was, let's say it was, let's say it was. And then you have this fucking kid that thinks that he debunks shit. How does the kid know or not know that perhaps just maybe, but listen, he doesn't believe in the multiverse. He doesn't understand time travel, doesn't believe in it. He thinks all this shit's made up. Even because we're talking about remote viewing in Russell Targ. Even if Larry Haber and his brother and son did concoct a story, some air quote, quotes, hoax, maybe they drew it from some space-time dimension where it is fucking for real. And they did not know that that is what they did now you can say grove well that can be said of any movie how do we know that george lucas didn't draw exactly exactly and terminator and star star trek and so on and so and sliders and quantum leap and paycheck and oblivion you name it because, because and, and Cloud Atlas and, and the list goes on. Because, because all of life's mysteries are answered in the movies. Now, if, and I'm just positing this and putting this out there as if it's a question. If the multiverse does exist and there are copies of Earth. There are other Earths, hashtag other Earths, hashtag other Americas, where things are slightly different by so many degrees of divergence, as is the case with John Teeter, as is the case with Quantum Leap, as is the case with the Netflix uh, show, uh, I don't know where it went, Parallels, as is the case with sliders, as is the case with a multitude of different, numerous different movies and storylines over time. You change one little thing, and then the ripple effect, domino effect, snowballs, mushrooms, it becomes some other thing. Not necessarily so much different, but slightly different. Just, just so different that it's different. Well, in terms of adjacencies, neighborhood of numbers, we're talking mathematically, bubble spaces. According to Russell Targ, there is no difference between 
there, here, here, and there. It's neither here nor there. There is no distance between anything. And what he talks about in this presentation that I saw tonight in terms of remote viewing and the work that he did at CIA for over 20 years is that they, these remote viewers at SRI, the standard um, uh, Stanford, uh, what is it, Research Institute, CIA had to separate itself from Stanford had to distance itself because of the implications of what they had discovered. And he shows mathematically that it is irrefutable what they did. He, he, in other words, he talks about, if you want proof, he gives you an example of an experiment with the control subject and the odds and how a million to one Every one of the 36 participants in any one of the like zillions of experiments they did, they all got it right nine out of 10 times with uh, a million to one odds. So it's like you have a million to one odds of winning the lottery when you scratch the scratch ticket. If you scratch this scratch ticket, there are a million tickets. You have one fucking chance of getting a million dollars from scratching that fucking scratch ticket. Well, you scratched that scratch ticket. You won a million dollars and you did nine tickets and you won a million dollars each time. And 36 people did nine tickets and they all won. A million dollars, nine out of ten times. How much fucking proof do you want at that point? That's your fucking proof. It was so impactful. It was so revealing. So revelational. <laughs> revelational? <laughs> is that a word? Listen, the Mandela effect is, is real. Things have been shifted and transposed and moved around and altered And every day you wake up and not just when you wake up, but just throughout the day, shit is micro fucking altered and changed. And that's my point. Neither here nor there. So what he says, and like the TV or the Netflix or show, whatever you can find it, wherever you can find it legally. Um, I just look for free shit on Google, man. Some people post shit and I don't know if I'm seeing shit that I'm not supposed to see for free on Google, but listen. Travelers, the show Travelers, when are we? When? Look at Rendlesham and James Pen- uh, Peniston. That craft that hovered over the base and shone a light below ground and deactivated nuclear weapons, I even proved online, I, you, if you know where to find it, <coughs> I proved online the glyphs that are on that craft, those are those are Freemasonic glyphs. They're they're because Freemasonry predates ancient Egypt, for those who don't know. Freemasonry predates ancient Egypt. If you look at those glyphs, and I've studied glyphs forever, the glyphs look relatively Egyptian. If you take that same set of glyphs and you overlay them with the set of Freemasonry glyphs that I demonstrate, it's an equal number and they look the fucking same. They're slightly different. They mean different things, but it's like one, two, three, four, five, six for Rendlesham's hyperspace craft glyphs. And then for the Egyptian uh, Freemasonic glyphs, it's one, two, three, four, five, six glyphs. So it's like 12 glyphs overlaying and they're clearly of the same fucking mathematical geometric design. So, so we made that shit. I'm saying humans, us, we designed those hyperspace crafts. 
And that's what James Penniston believes. And that's what Air Force researchers believe. So when is date of origin 81 fucking hundred? The year 8100? When the fuck is that? We obviously have hyperspace crafts, vehicles, that are aerospace autonomous designed to seek out, sense, detect, locate, detect, disable, and deactivate all nuclear weapons. That shit was located underground, under bedrock, goddamn bedrock, and it deactivated those nuclear weapons. The other thing that a lot of people don't know about Rendlesham, it wasn't just one craft, it's multiple crafts. And then if you listen in and you listen to more of what happened, it's not just James Penniston. He was accompanied by others. And those others are quite revealing in terms of what happened to them after the revelation, where they were taken. Because apparently Rendlesham, the base where the Brits and us, the Americans, where we had the joint base of operations, the aliens from the future have a base under our joint base on some time frame. Dude was drugged, was taken underground by some type of futuristic breakaway civilization alien entity. And uh, he was shown certain technology that's beyond fucking comprehension currently on this timeline. A lot of people don't know that. There was also a lawsuit in which uh, Penniston was awarded certain uh, monetary compensation by the U.S. government, intelligence community, the U.S. uh, military. Because of, um, I'm, I'm assuming, radiation exposure and disorientation. Because we're talking about hyperspace shit. Now, I know what the fuck I know. I know timelines overlap. I know that shit. I know that Al Bielik saying that he's actually Ed Cameron reincarnate. I know that shit's true too. When I listen to Al Bielik speak, I know he's not a man making up some fucking crazy insane lunatic story. He's not. I've seen the records. He worked on U.S. military projects. They try to rot, they try to write, write off Bob Lazar and say he's insane. George Knapp, Las Vegas investigative journalist, and many others have been able to concretely determine and conclude that Bob Lazar was in fact part of those projects. They erased his background at MIT. He clearly was at S4. He's the one that broke the story of Area 51 from the very beginning. America and the world know about Area 51 because of Bob Lazar. So there's obviously duality here, and this is what goes back to what I started this podcast based on, Carigo. Carigo is a website where you can develop forever memories that will never go away. So I saw recently on YouTube this interesting video where it was something like, a time traveler's toolkit, things you need to know. One of the things they were talking about was penicillin. And I was like, yo, that's right out of sliders because the spoiler alert, I'm not going to say anything more than that. Maybe you need to go out and get spoilers. I'm sorry. That's not what I meant to say. Maybe you need to go out and get sliders and watch until you find the episode involving penicillin. I'm not going to say anything more than that, but listen, If we are traveling between these different dimensions of space-time and we're unaware of it, mostly, don't you think you should know some shit as travelers? Because if you're unaware that today, though it seems like yesterday, like Groundhog's Day, you're actually on a different timeline because we just, our energy for, you know, sort like our mind energy though it appears to be the same universe, but it's like a tick of like what it's like one gradation of, you know, don't you think that you should be forming like long-term memories, like skill sets that like that, uh, what's the word, (laughs) the word, don't you think that you ought to have certain skill sets 
that uh, that I'll come back to that as 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 I ponder and I think about the appropriate word for what it is that that I'm attempt that I'm trying to refer to here. Carigo is a website, I guess, a skill skill sets that span multiple timelines. Like, do you know how to fly right now? Listen, I can't give any kind of legal, business, financial, medical advice, but man, if some shit gets weird, don't you want to know how to fly? How about sail? Can you outrig? You know what I'm saying? Like, have you studied up on like the International Space Station, biomedicine, bioinformatics, like big data, data science? Listen, within the intelligence community, there are fields and subfields that are classified People don't even know that there's a field of knowledge known as this particular field because the name of that field is classified. Does that seem crazy? I'm just simply saying, wouldn't you want to know what that field is and what it entails, what it encompasses? Practical skills and, you know, core principles. The general idea, the main idea, the crux of it all. Why are there fields of knowledge that are off limits to some humans? So let's say there are copies of Earth and some of those copies are being developed. That is scaled up by certain breakaway civilizations that are saying, okay, if some shit goes awry here, we can jump here. But this timeline here isn't up to date as this one is. Well, listen, what I'm saying to you is this. On a system-wide level, spellings are different. Grammar's different. Architecture, pathways, geometry, like civil engineering, circuitry, design structure, like pixels, shit is different. And that's where the Mandela effect comes into fucking play. When it's alleged that Larry Haber and his brother and son are making up a story, are they really? Are they really frauds? Is Andrew... Basiago or Basaggio, however you pronounce his name, or some other pronunciation, is are these people really making up these stories? Come to think of it, Larry Haber is a lawyer, and so is Andrew. So are these lawyers with these degrees and these backgrounds, you, you say for financial gain? Doesn't doesn't really add up in my book, man. There's there's too much cover up on the government's part. For me to believe. That Andrew Bas- Basiago Basaggio and Larry Haber, who are independent of one another, not even connected in any way, shape, or form, for them to be making up these stories. The government's covering up information. Half the story of John Teeter is is has been has been scrubbed from the internet. I've read it. You can find it. I'm not telling you to do anything illegal. I read the other half. It's actually pretty fucking sinister. It's pretty dark. It's pretty like jaw dropping and it's pretty fucking eye opening. Like if God forbid that shit actually happened on this timeline. And then the other question is how much can we actually, let's say it is real. How much can we trust John Teeter? That is, that's a question that's been posed. Is he a liar? Is he trying to fuck up our timeline? Some people believe that he came here not just to obtain an IBM 5100, but that he came here to avert Y2K. Listen, you can think that shit is outlandish, far-fetched, and far-flung. I know it's a lot of data. But when you talk about the space force, when you talk about saving earth, planet earth, when you talk about the multiverse and humanity, okay, the human brain mind, we are quantum computers. So what seems like a massive amount of data, what is this fucking one hour, 14 minutes to say shit. There are video presentations on YouTube that are like hour 53 minutes. And I've watched zillions of them. This is small beans. This podcast episode compared to what your human brain mind can actually fucking do. So, again, questions, Montauk, copies of Earth. 
is Larry Haber a fraud or is he channeling from some other dimension? And if he is channeling, if he, he, he even even if he thinks he made it up, assuming I'm just saying, going with the theory of this debunker that he made it up, did he really make it up? Is it like Aldebaran, the Aldebaran, like Maria, whatever her name is, Orsic? She was channeling shit from another star system timeline. Maybe, maybe the Habers, they're like, ha, 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 we're going to capitalize. We're going to make crazy money. It's going to be nuts. And then they made this shit up, but they didn't really make it up. Maybe they just didn't fucking make it up altogether. Maybe it's just some real shit, period. Regardless, regardless, half of the information has been fucking classified by the U.S. intelligence community. The government's hiding something, and it's not just the part about the IBM 50 and 100. It's the part about the the history of that timeline that is depicted. They tried to get rid of that. Um, Listen, Half of the John Teeter story is not known. I know the other half of the fucking story. And if you read it, if you fucking knew, know what I know, you'd be like, wait a second. This doesn't sound that crazy after all, which makes sense as to why they would delete and scrub and sanitize the information because they don't want you to know that there are other fucking timelines and that this shit happened on that fucking timeline. Because if you have knowledge of other timelines, then guess what? Why work? Why pay taxes? Why have any incentive to do anything to input into the system? Why? When you, you know, because then you're just kind of like restless, like, Man, wait a second. This is like a copy of another place that might be better. Like, what? Of course, they don't want you to know that time travel is fucking real. But they've developed the DARPA IXS Enterprise. Oh, did I say DARPA IXS Enterprise? I wonder where they would have gotten the term, the name Enterprise. Maybe it's from Star Trek. So let's say you're an advanced breakaway civilization and you can jump from one time frame, anti-gravity, zip, Russell Targ, space time, it's an illusion, boom, we're one displacement unit of Earth over here. So basically you're on this Earth and then you time frame move to another Earth. Right, I see where you're going with this grove. There are an infinite number, perhaps. So you go to this other one, and it's kind of a virgin, kind of like timeline. Well, if you're an entity that goes there, travels there, um, hey, I have an idea. I'm going to create a movie industry, and I'm going to sell stories and narratives to the general populace. Hey, in the future, there are these crazy robots that go rogue, haywire, AI. They're called Terminators. Oh, yeah. And then listen, hey, my buddy, he also makes movies. There's another future with this thing called the Death Star. And there's Darth Vader. And there's, like, Luke Skywalker. And, like, you know, and then there's there's this other movie. Okay. Then you make billions of dollars selling narratives to fucking different Earths. Imagine that. You have the ability to jump from Earth to Earth to Earth to Earth to Earth. And you can bring technologies, stories for those populations, for those inhabitants. Does that sound a little wacky? Does that seem a little like far-fetched? Really? Well, then if it does... Why is it that so many lawyers are involved in this experience? I know what you're saying, Grove. That's a fallacy. You're saying that experts somehow substantiate, corroborate your tremendous claim, Grove. No, they're they're not all professionals. They're not all experts. 
I'm just simply saying when you do the math like I have, super string theory, which isn't really a theory. I'm just saying you take all the data points and you fucking put them side by side and you string it all together. These people can't all be fucking crazy and they can't all be liars. When I listen to Al Bielik, when I listen to Larry Haber, when I listen to Gene Roddenberry, when I listen to Russell Targ, who was paid by CIA for 20 fucking years, he says there is no distance between any two fucking points. And the ancients knew that shit. There is not there. There is not here. There is no such fucking thing. Neither here nor there.